Hello and welcome to Deal Flow, the show that puts the spotlight on merger and acquisition activity. On the African continent, I'm Erika van der Marwe. MA specialists tell us that in the fine print of this year's revision of South Africa's tax law, you'll find some proposals that could have major implications for deal making and the viability of certain deal structures. We're spending some time looking at that in the show with our panel of experts. We get you in the mood for that with our deals of the week. PPC Cement has reached an agreement to buy a controlling equity stake in South African blended cement producer Safika Cement for around 35 million US dollars. South African lender Transaction Capital will sell its payment services unit Paycorp to private equity firm Actus for 95 million US dollars. Paycorp owns and operates off-site ATMs and installs credit and debit card payment terminals. Walmart is considering making a bid for the Hong Kong supermarket business Park and Shop, being sold by a company controlled by Asia's richest man, Li Kaxing. The world's largest retailer is weighing up its options ahead of this week's preliminary bid deadline. And Jeff Bezos, the multi-billionaire founder of online retailer Amazon.com, is buying the Washington Post and a handful of other newspaper assets for 250 million US dollars. South Africa's tax law amendment bill includes some elements that could have major implications for deal making and the viability of certain deal structures. Well, we've got the tax experts in to look at this. Mark Linnington, Director and Head of Tax at Weber Wenzel. And in our Cape Town studio, Leroux Rulofsa, Director for Tax at Deloitte and Touche. Welcome to both of you. Good to have the experts at our fingertips. So Mark, let me begin with you. And, and um, Leroux, I'll be asking you this too. In your opinion, what's the spirit of some of these changes to the tax law? Because it really looks as though um, debt within uh, funding structures is being targeted. Yes, it has been a focus of National Treasury for some time now. They've been looking at various um, uh, funding arrangements and tightening the legislation uh, to curb uh, perceived abusive areas. Um, so we've seen uh, legislation uh, in regard to preference shares, um, which is a fairly hard-hitting legislation. Um, and it's aimed at a fairly narrow um, area of perceived tax abuse. But unfortunately, there's lots of collateral damage. Hmm. Um, well, Luru, if you could come in here. So quite uh, considered changes to the tax law, as Mark says, perceived um, abuse uh, of, of uh, some tax concessions. But the trouble is that the innocent are affected too. What's your opinion? Yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, that is the case. Um, what we're seeing in South Africa is part of, what, of, of a move that we see globally, where base erosion is, is, is the buzzword, and um, governments trying to protect their tax base. And as Mark says, in South Africa, a perceived area of tax avoidance, uh, or tax evasion, is, is around um, companies that, that are too highly leveraged and geared uh, in acquisitions, and take on too much debt uh, on their balance sheet, and um, Often if the funding is provided from, from abroad, um, you find that the, there's no um, tax parity and that the lender is not taxed on, on, the, on the interest that is paid whilst the, uh, the borrower is claiming a tax deduction. And I think, um, as Mark said, they've, they've been toying with various proposals and we've been having a discussion really for the last um, three, four years around what, what is appropriate. This is the latest instalment in, in what um, Treasury is coming forward with. And, um, Unfortunately, um, there will be a lot of um, collateral damage. Mm. So, Mark, no surprises. This has been a few years in the making, as Leroux says. So, so I think every year you're seeing a slightly different variance of it. Yeah, it started in uh, 2010 in a big way when um, National Treasury froze Section 45. Um, and that was overnight? It was, yeah. to everyone's surprise. Yeah. And um, they, they were looking back at deals that were concluded um, in the boom years uh, leading up to uh, 2008 um, when the sub subprime issue manifested. And um, the gearing levels were high and they were seeing that companies' uh, taxable income was being uh, wiped out by interest uh, cost. And they reacted very strongly to that by freezing Section 45 
but they backed down, they backed uh, off from that, um, and their aim was to put in a long-term fix where there wa was uh, an objective system to uh, determine what is their acceptable level of uh, debt funding. So a rules-based system. Yes, right? and that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the rules-based system being introduced. Um, and there are lots of teething problems with uh, the proposed legislation. Um, um, and it's, uh, it's debatable whether it's a better system than the current discretionary system. Uh, my personal view is it is. It's going to give a lot more certainty uh, to companies. They know what they're dealing with. Um, you won't have to go off to SARS and get uh, a ruling for your transactions anymore. Um, and also, it, um, it takes a, a, a lot of uh, a pain away from the whole process because you, you don't have to look to a bank's pool of funds anymore to see if they have uh, exempt depositor base anymore. Um, you, you don't have to concern yourself with the, this, this, uh, the, the lender's uh, tax status. Okay. So it's uh, a much more predictable outcome, would you say? It is a lot more predictable. Um, Luru, so this is section 45, as I understand it, of the Income Tax Act, this component that we're talking about, limiting the extent um, to which in a deal structure um, the interest on debt can be used to offset against the tax liability, if I stand, understand it correctly. In your opinion, are the rules proposed by Treasury fair in this instance? I, I would agree that um, certainly we need to move to a, a, a system um, where we have rules that apply um, across the spectrum. The, the, the current um, scenario where you have to go for approval to get a, um, a deduction um, is, is not, uh, it's really not satisfactory. So if we, know, we need to know what the rules clearly are, I think where the teething problems come in and the issues come in is that they have essentially the, the proposal that's put forward around the debt reduction, and this is a limitation, and this is one, one leg to, um, to really to the proposals. The other leg is around the recharacterization of, of dividends as taxable income. But on this leg, the proposal that's put forward is to limit um, the interest that can be claimed to a percentage of EBITDA, um, roughly 40% of EBITDA, broadly speaking. So um, EBITDA being some, some sort of definition of earnings, right? It's questionable as to whether or not that is the correct measure uh, and whether we shouldn't have maybe a balance sheet test uh, where one looks at a debt equity and a company's balance sheet um, because taxable income varies from year to year and there could be external factors. Um, and the risk going this route um, is that you actually could penalise companies at times when they are in distress because their taxable income drops and the, and the ability um, to offset the interest deduction becomes smaller. And so I think one could talk about the test, but in, in, in concept, in principle, um, I don't think too many people would fault that. Right, so we've looked at some of the technicalities of this, Mark and Leroux. If, if the legislation were to be enacted as it is proposed now, and I know the comments are in uh, last Monday, the 5th of August, were the second round of submissions on that. If, if these were to be implemented, Mark, how could it change the deal-making landscape? Um, I think it's actually going to free up uh, deal making uh, um, compared to the discretionary system. I think it's going to open up avenues of debt that are currently not available to um, for transactions. Um, so you know we can uh, we can access uh, foreign lenders now. We can access um, exempt lenders. Uh, uh, we won't have those restrictions placed on us, which are currently inherent in the discretionary mm -hmm. system. Um, and th there's going to be a lot more certainty as to your tax shield over the, the investment cycle. So um, I think it's, it's overall a big improvement. Luru, but it does mean less debt being used potentially within, a, within deals. Does it make it more expensive then to do deals? And are uh, certain uh, parties then excluded from accessing funding? Yes, it, it may make it more expensive. I think one thing that one also needs to be clear on is that there are very, um, many different um, types of transactions that are being done. So certain transactions certainly would be affected um, and, and negatively affected. Um, but it is, uh, as Mark says, we, it's going to free up other avenues that currently um, are not that readily available. Um, so it will, um, in particular instances, you will see um, it becoming more expensive. Um, it's also true, though, that um, we are already seeing um, a, a lot less debt being, being put into transactions um, to, to make them more sustainable. 
So maybe in the end, not, not that big a change. Mm. And there's certain kinds of deals, if we look at BE deals, Mark, we, we know the, the, the volume of deals seem, that seems to have come down since the peak years of what, 2007, 2008, yeah. um, It's But some BE deals still need to be done. Many of them use pref share structures to do that. So there, there, there's the proposal that we've just touched on peripherally um, that, that could also become more expensive. Yeah, look, um, the changes uh, affecting preference shares, um, they're not damning in themselves. They're, they're, it, it's still workable. You just have to be very careful. And it, 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 it's become quite a volatile structure because something can happen in the future that, that taints uh, the whole structure for under these new anti-avoidance rules. So uh, these deals still, still can be done. Um, the, it's just some of the attributes of these deals uh, could be limiting in some circumstances. But um, on the whole, um, uh, it's still workable. So, Leroux, if we had to just stop and stand back, if you had to describe the, uh, the animal spirit, the, the, the level of confidence in the deal-making environment, what you're seeing as deals come across your desk and you're structuring them, is there confidence, is there optimism? And then with proposed tax changes such as these, are you confident that there'll be sufficient activity um, in the months and years ahead? Yes, I'm confident. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the so-called BEE deals need to be done in one sense or other, so they will continue to be done. Um, we haven't seen any any proposals that that are killing the ability to do deals. Um, one needs to be smarter around it. Um, I think what what I'd, what we'd like to see though is particularly in the area of of hybrid debt, um, recharacterizing um, in, uh, dividend income into interest income, or vice versa. Uh, we'd like to see a bit more certainty. We've got a lot of changes over the past two to three years, and there are a lot of changes being proposed now. And there could be some, some unintended consequences, for, ex for example, um, excluding um, or recharacterizing um, interest as dividends where, where uh, debt is, listed debt is issued in order to, to obtain funding. Um, one needs to question the, the wisdom of that. Mm. Um, but I don't, I don't see debt dying uh, or deals dying as a result of these changes. So Mark, plenty of warnings there. You've also warned about the unintended consequences. But in conclusion, just your, your sentiment, the outlook for you on the deal making side. I think it's overall an improvement. I think taxpayers just need to be a lot more attentive to their tax planning. Um, Consult their tax lawyers? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, but uh, overall, it's, uh, it's a good development. I think, I think there are going to be lots of teething problems, particularly with the other uh, amendments around, um, around cross-border debt and uh, controlling relationship debt and um, how it interacts with the new thin cap rules. They're, they're yes. we, we actually got a barrage of, of legislation around this, and it's, it's going to take time for it to settle and to work out how it all interacts and, and affects taxpayers. So. It's just uh, going to make it um, more onerous on taxpayers to, to address this, but uh, it's certainly, we're certainly open for business. I don't think um, they, they are deal killers, yeah. Mm. Well, Mark and Leroux, thank you very much for your time and for your insights. Mark Linnington is from Weber Wenzel, and in Cape Town we had Leroux Rulofsa from Deloitte and Touche. Do stay tuned to CNBC Africa after the break. In WealthQuest, Samantha Loring and her strategist Quirby and Roland get graphic. Goodbye until next week. Mm.